All right. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, this is Steve Wilson at the Illinois State Water Survey at the University of Illinois. And I'm here with Katie Hollenbeck from currently the Water Resources Center at the U of I. And today we're um, conducting a webinar on is your water safe to drink, common questions about private wells. And this um, presentation and our class, all the material we provide, the videos and everything we do through the privatewellclass.org um, <clears throat> is all funded by US EPA and um, we're able to do what we do because of our partnership with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership uh, who is the lead on a grant uh, from US EPA uh, to help well owners all over the country. And RCAP is um, an organization that provides technical assistance and training um, in all 50 states and uh, we uh, want to acknowledge them and all the effort that they've uh, provided to get us where we are. Okay, so um, quickly, if you are a, a NEHA member, I um, want to point out that you can only take this class once in during your credentialing cycle. So if your credentialing cycle ends on 9-30-17, which is next month, you can take the class today and then any time after 10-1 and count it for the next cycle, but you can't take it twice during this current cycle. So if you are on the webinar either on 424 or on 121, this is the same core content um, as those two presentations. And I, I just want to make it clear to anyone in attendance that if you um, are taking this for CE credit, you can't get credit for, for it again um, if it's during the same credentialing cycle. So, um, with that, we're going to move on. Oh, and I guess I, I should mention to Katie uh, Hollenbeck can help with um, if you need a copy of the slide deck or a certificate of attendance if you're looking for um, some other kind of paperwork that will help you get credentialing in your state or your local health area um, if you're interested. So um, today's webinar, as I mentioned, is part of this national program through RCAP. And our materials today follow our privatewellclass.org um, lessons. Um, if you're not familiar with those, if you go to privatewellclass.org, you can sign up to take our class. It's free. Um, there's 10 lessons that walk you through how groundwater flows through the ground, all the way through what to do about treatment if you need it. And it's funded. Um, yeah as I mentioned, by US EPA, and uh, we're housed at the University of Illinois. RCAP's uh, got offices in all 50 states. So uh, today, I left Dan Webb up here. Um, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the Water Survey. Katie Hollenbeck at the Water Resources Center um, is taking questions. So I want to mention on your GoToWebinar um, screen, if you will, you've got a question or a chat box. If during the webinar today you have any questions, um, that come up that you didn't ask in advance. Um, Katie's tracking those and we'll pull them up at the end and we'll try to answer what we can. Usually, Dan Webb, who manages our public service lab here at the Water Survey, and we do well sampling for private well owners in the state of Illinois, um, would be here to help with the water quality related questions. Unfortunately, he's gone today and so uh, you're stuck with me. And uh, the questions that I can't answer we will uh, take down and note, and if you want to email us um, when that come, time comes, um, we can get an answer and email it back to you. So, um, yeah, with that, uh, some things about being a private well owner. You're, they're not regulated in the, in the country, so you're on your own as a well owner to make sure your water is safe and your system's maintained. You can really liken that to being the water operator for a very, very small community water system, the community being your family. Um, it's no different than a small community that has a water operator. Their job is to make sure the water's safe, to test it, to make sure what they're putting out in their distribution system that goes to all the homes in their community, uh, meets all the safe drinking water standards, and is uh, has enough pressure, all those things. That's your job as a private well owner. So. Um, one of the things to remember is a lot of people judge water by how it looks, tastes, or smells. You really can't do that. And why uh, it's recommended that you test uh, is because some of the some contaminants can be odorless, tasteless, and colorless. I hope I said that right. Um, 
And so I grew up on an old hand dug well uh, that my grandpa hand dug in 1933. But now I live in a community of about 150,000 residents where our, I pay 40 to $50 a month to my community water supply um, for all those things. And so with, as a well owner, you're responsible for those uh, to make sure it's safe, to make sure that you have water coming to the tap, um, and all those things. So it's certainly a lot more independent, but it's also a lot more responsibility. Um, what we try to do with our class and all the material we provide is really help well owners understand some of the basics of being a well owner. So you need to understand your well log, where your water's coming from, the depth of your well, the depth of your screen, if it's got a screen, uh, the pump setting, so that you understand, um, you know, my water is coming from an old hand dug well that's only 14 feet deep, and what that means versus my well's coming, or my water's coming from a 200 foot sand and gravel well with a screen from 196 to 200. It certainly makes a difference related to surface water influences and uh, can make a difference in water quality. It can also be that there's naturally occurring contaminants um, in certain areas. You know, we have areas in Illinois where there might be high arsenic. Um, I'll show some examples later where there's some other high constituents. And so the whole goal of all this is to help you learn some of the basics so that when you do go to your local source of information, whether it be your health department or extension or uh, your state agency um, or even your university, that you're asking better questions and, um, you know, you're learning as you go, so to speak. And the last thing here, you know, it's about sampling your well. That's, you'll hear that a lot from us, and it's, there's no substitute for it. And you might think your water tastes great, and it's just fine, but unless you've tested it, you really don't know for sure. So um, about water quality and testing, that's kind of the, you know, that's the big elephant in the room, if you will. Um, it's all about keeping your water uh, safe and potable and making sure that what your family's drinking um, isn't going to harm them. So uh, we get lots of questions about that on sampling. Where do you collect it? What do I test for? And so we're going to run through those things today. Um, and what do you do when you, uh, you know, get the results? So um, where do you collect the sample? So what we recommend, um, you know, most of the time you're getting water from your kitchen sink, uh, or I take that back here. Um, the water coming out of your kitchen sink could be very different from the water at an outside spigot or outside tap. And that's because you may have treatment. Um, you might have um, a softener, for instance, or some other device, and also um, it might have been sitting in your pipes overnight, and depending on the type of pipes, some of those situations, uh, the water could change. Or maybe you're bringing it up uh, out of the ground and it's uh, exposed to oxygen and it wasn't before, and so things can leach out of that or, or uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So what our lab does and what Dan would tell you if you called him to get a water sample um, is uh, we usually try to get two sets of samples, one um, with, one that's from an outside spigot and one from uh, your kitchen sink, and that's if you know if you have lead pipes, if your house is older, or if you have some kind of treatment device. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, but as you go to find a lab, um, and I'll show you in the questions somebody asked about labs, so I put it down there in this presentation. Um, when you talk to a lab, they should be able to give you the, all the instructions you need, if they're going to mail you a kit versus if you're going to pick a kit up, what you need to do to make sure you get it back in time so that the, the results can be um, determined in a timely manner um, before, you know, the certain methods that require things to be done in 48 hours, for instance. And so you need to be comfortable with the lab that you do deal with, uh, that they uh, take care of those things for you. So what do you test for? Well, it really depends on your situation, um, how deep your well is, what geologic formation your water is coming from, if there are any known contaminants in the area. So a good example, uh, Tazewell County in Illinois has uh, arsenic in the Muhammad Aquifer. It's a sand and gravel aquifer. So if a well owner from that area contacted us, we would certainly ask that they or suggest they test for arsenic. But your county or state health department probably has a good idea of what naturally occurring contaminants there might be in different parts of your state or your area, and so you should ask them. And, um, you know, talk to your neighbors, your driller, uh, co-op extension. Um, all those folks may have an idea if there's anything that's been found in the area or if there's any natural occurring. 
And what we recommend is you sample for coliform and nitrate annually. They indicate a pathway to your well, into your well. So nitrate uh, by itself um, is harmful to children and baby, especially babies, blue baby syndrome. But for adults, um, there's some discussion on whether it's uh, hazardous or not. There have been studies that show both ways. And coliform itself isn't necessarily something that's going to make you sick. But in both cases, they're fairly um, extensive in our environment now because of farming and just the natural occurring bacteria from our cells and livestock and everything else. Um, so if you find one of those things in your well, it likely means that there's some breach in your well construction or there's something that's not sealed properly that should be that allows those things to get in your well because they shouldn't be there. Um, you shouldn't have high nitrate or coliform unless there's either a local shallow source and your well is shallow or if there's some kind of um, you know, well construction issue where your well is not properly sealed or has a crack in the casing or um, you know, there's no vent tube and there should be some of those uh, things. So um, one example here, this is on Rhode Island Department of Health's website. They show two contaminants. The small little circles are all where there used to be orchards where a lot of arsenic was used. And so this map is, uh, you know, Rhode Island's about 30 by 40 square miles, I believe, a fairly small uh, state. Uh, there are certainly counties that are larger than this in some parts of the country. But what this shows you is in your area, if you see a lot of these little dots or if it's right where you live, there might have been an orchard nearby. And so they're suggesting you test for arsenic. The big splotch that's in the middle third of the, the map is actually beryllium. And so it's a natural occurring uh, source of high beryllium in that area. Um, and I say this every time, but before we started doing this uh, project uh, five or six years ago when I was investigating some of these things, I didn't realize that beryllium was a regulated contaminant. Uh, you just don't see it that often. But if you live in this part of Rhode Island, uh, it's probably a good idea to test for it. And it does have health effects. And so um, if you do live in this area, you know, this is a state providing you information on some of the things you, te you should test for. Uh, this is Massachusetts DEP. They have a website set up where you can type in your address. And if you have a bedrock well, it'll tell you if you need to be concerned about either arsenic or uranium. And so, um, you know, it's a tool they've developed. And you can read through that on their website. You can zoom in but you can type in your address and it will say, yeah, you probably should test for arsenic if you're in this area or uranium. So again, this is the state agency that's got a lot of information they've gathered over a long period of time where they've created uh, a way for you as a well owner uh, in that state to uh, find more information. And some of these get more sophisticated. So the Wisconsin Department of, uh, Department of uh, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, um, had uh, the University of Stevens Point developed this interactive mapping tool and it shows you by county you can search by different constituents what I've done for this screenshot is I searched for arsenic by county and show um, the the standard that a community water supply has to meet for the Safe Drinking Water uh, Act for arsenic is 10 parts per billion and so what this shows you is the counties where the average sample has been less than uh, five where there's been none detected or they don't have any samples, and then where it's been higher than that um, for the average for the samples they have. And so what it points out here is there's three counties in red where they um, have more of a known high arsenic issue. And uh, the standard's 10. The average sample in these counties is over 21. Um, but it gives you a starting point. So if you live in Wisconsin, you can call the State uh, Department of Natural Resources and talk to their folks Find out, is that from five samples or 50? How widespread is this? Uh, do you have any more detailed information? Here's where I live. And they can give you advice on what you should sample for. So the idea here is more and more of this information is becoming available. You just have to go look for it. And uh, I will mention that in our lessons, one of the lessons, lesson seven for our class, is all about how to find local information. As um, one small group at the University of Illinois we can't solve every well owner's issue and know everything about every county, if you will, in the state, in the, in the country. And so part of our job is to teach you um, 
some of the basics so that you can go ask your local health department or your state, uh, in this case Department of Natural Resources, for more information so you're better informed about what issues you might have and whether you want to uh, be drinking the water or you want to add treatment or um, you know what you should sample for. So uh, there's a lot of information out there, you just have to go find it. So what we recommend, and this is again for anyone in the country, is that you sample for coliform bacteria and nitrate annually, um, and those again are indicators. They tell you that there might be a pathway into your well from near the surface. And that's important whether you have a garden nearby or livestock nearby or your septics nearby or your spraying nearby, whatever it might be, uh, even if you have your lawn treated, um, that could be an issue if uh, you have a breach in your well. And so uh, you shouldn't see those things. And, and again, and then the, the list here in the middle is really something we recommend every three to five years. Um, so for instance, pH, your pH shouldn't change. Um, if the pH of your groundwater in a, you know, a fairly deep, let's say over 100 foot uh, uh, sand and gravel well, the pH of the aquifer should remain fairly consistent. Groundwater moves, but it moves slowly. And so, you know, like our groundwater in Illinois, it's always going to be hard. Um, and so you're always going to need to treat it. We have some manganese and iron issues. Uh, there's a few places in our state where we see fluoride, but if the, for instance, if the arsenic in a given uh, well is at 20, uh, five years from now, I have several monitoring wells around the state that we sample every 10 years. You can count on those arsenic levels in those wells to be almost the same every time. And if that changed or if the pH were to change dramatically from one sample to the next five years later, that indicates that something's changed with the well or with the aquifer, and it gives you a reason to start asking more questions and try to find out what it might be, uh, because it really shouldn't change. And again, get advice from your local or state health department. You know, a lot of people um, are afraid to talk to their local or state health department because they're afraid they might tell them they can't use their well. That's just not the case. Um, if you get a sample collected and, and take care of it yourself, um, there are some rules related to change of property. Um, for when you sell a property, that might go with that in some areas, but um, again, you're on your own as a well owner uh, to test your well. And they're really here to help you, and you should really um, try to lean on your state, county, or local health department uh, for answering some of these questions. So I want to show you an example of a well uh, here in Illinois, near Muhammad, Illinois. And so this is the, the water sample that was done at the State uh, Water Survey Lab in 2015. And I show this because um, under treatment here near the top, it says there's, been, uh, there's no treatment. So this was collected from the outside spigot on the side of the house. He let it run um, for a little while and then took a water sample. Um, and for our purposes, because we also do research related to uh, groundwater quality and helping communities with understanding uh, issues related to water quantity and quality, um, we ask that a lot of folks collect a raw sample, which would be the quote well water sample, as well as a drinking water sample from inside their house. And so in this case, the things I want to point out are the pH is 8.02, uh, the hardness near the bottom right is 351 milligrams per liter, uh, the sodium's at 25.9, and the magnesium's at 33.6, um, and iron's at 2.99. So he took a second sample after his filtration. He has a five micron filter and a softener, and you can see what happened to the iron and the manganese. Um, you can also see how much higher the sodium is. And the reason we, I point this out is um, if you have someone who's on a low sodium diet, you may not realize that your water softener, if you're using regular softener salt, um, might be increasing your so sodium intake uh, to a level that's um, you know, not recommended by your doctor. And so if that is the case, here's an example of where this water analysis has really provided some good information. You can see the hardness is down to 0.68 from 351. And again, that's because and that's a water softener's job. And so his water softener is working like it should. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of changes in water chemistry after the water's come out of the well and it's in the house. And that's because of their treatment. He also has a um, reverse osmosis system underneath his kitchen sink. And so he took a sample after that as well. And I show that because you can see all these less than arrows. They all mean it's less than the detection limit. 
So an RO unit, along with everything else that he's got on his treatment system, um, has removed almost most of the constituents in his groundwater. Um, it's un the turbidity is unmeasurable, the color. Um, the one thing to note here, um, it even took the sodium down from 198 down to 6.24. Um, the one thing to note, though, is it also lowered his pH. So um, where this might be an issue is if the natural water quality wasn't at 8, uh, of a pH of 8 like it is in Illinois, you might be in an area where the natural pH is already at 6, then taking a lot of stuff out of the water may lower it even further, and that be can become a problem if you have copper um, or lead pipes or copper or lead solder from uh, copper pipes as well. And so if it's just at your kitchen sink, then the water's not traveling through a lot of piping material that might cause it to leach lead. Um, but if you had a whole house RO system, which some people do, um, then that could cause uh, some of those issues. And so again, this is really just as an, uh, used as an example to say, you need to understand what your water quality is and, and what's actually coming out your tap so you have a better idea of what that might mean. And if you take this, uh, this information to a qualified health professional, they can certainly help you um, understand that as well. So um, when should you test your well? Well, in addition to um, what I've already mentioned, anytime your well's been opened, that uh, promotes the chance for a bacteria getting in your well. And so you should disinfect. Um, and test, uh, and any time that you do have to disinfect your well, say you've tested and there was coliform, um, so you disinfect, you need to take a, a resample to make sure that it's actually uh, gone. And any time there's a, any kind of emergency response event, so this example, you can see the melted wires here and the melted well cap. Um, a forest fire came through this area. This is uh, from a county in Colorado who provided us some pictures, and, um, you know, if there's a fire coming or if there's going to be a flood, one of the things you should do before you leave your home is turn off the power. Um, in some cases, these melted wires can cause your pump to turn on and uh, run continuously, and uh, if uh, that could even burn up your pump in some cases. And so there's all these issues that, that go along with these things. But um, clearly until this is fixed and the new wiring's in place and the pump's been checked out, um, once all of that's done, then you'd want to test your well before you drink from it, just to make sure that nothing else happened uh, from this uh, extreme event that caused a problem uh, for you. Okay, so where do you get it analyzed? Um, again, because of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the federal law that basically says that as a community, you have to provide safe water for the residents of your community, um, there are labs that are accredited to do those analysis. And by being accredited, it means they passed a test, so to speak, that says they do good work. They can meet all the criteria for how to collect this or for how to analyze a sample that meets uh, the EPA criteria. And, um, and so every state lists those labs on their uh, website. And so the, we recommend uh, for the general public to use one of those labs if you can. Um, it may be a little more expensive, but it indicates that um, you know, they do have the wherewithal to do the work that you need and to provide uh, compar comparable and uh, results that are likely to be accurate. Um, I say that knowing that our public service lab is no longer accredited mainly because of the costs of being accredited. Um, and, you know, in Illinois, we recommend folks uh, come to our lab. Uh, it, it does provide good analysis, and there's several programs like that, Virginia Tech, Texas A&M, there's a number of university labs that may not be accredited just because of the expense to do so and they're not in it for, um, you know, it's not a business per se. Um, and so I just want to mention that. And you can also use that as a first run, if you will. Take, get a sample collected by a state lab. It's probably um, by a university lab. It's probably going to be a little less expensive. And if something shows up, then you can use that to um, do something further. So, um, but whatever lab you choose, you know, a good lab should be able to give you detailed sampling instructions, explain how to store and preserve your sample, and also be able to answer your questions like, you know, what should I sample for? If you have a lab that can't do those things, I would find a different lab. Um, we work with a lot of labs, including the Association of Public Health Laboratories, and we've made that very clear. 
that this is the advice we give well owners. Um, their labs need to have some wherewithal to be able to help you as a well owner know what to do. Um, you know, we've had well owners call us and say, well, I called a lab and they're asking me what I should sample for. I'm, I called them to find out what I should sample for. Um, they should be able to help you and understand what's going on uh, in your area and give you all that kind of advice, including the bottles. And in some states, depending on what the sample's for, I know in Pennsylvania, if you want to have a sample collected that's defendable in court, um, the lab actually comes out and collects the sample for you. Um, as far as interpreting results, there are websites available where you can type in your results and look online and get a sense of what that is. But our advice is to always take your sample results to a, a public health lab or a public health department, whether that be your local county or state, and ask them um, for advice and get a qualified answer. They're health professionals; that's their job, and they should be able to help you. Um, and you know, I'm not a health professional; I'm a groundwater hydrologist, so. Um, I'm, I shouldn't be giving you health advice. Now that said, there are some websites that have been developed out there that um, are really helpful in at least getting an idea of what your sample results might mean. And so um, the one that we've uh, recommended, I'll show you here in a second. I do want to mention that um, if you do find something in your well, especially if it's outrageous, like you know arsenic is 100 times the, the sampling or the, uh, the legal quote limit for a community water supply, Sometimes it's best to, to reconfirm, and, um, and that means collecting a second sample and having it reanalyzed. Uh, labs make mistakes. Um, if you're the one who handled the sample, you might have made a mistake and uh, somehow contaminated that sample, not realized it. And if, uh, especially if it's something, um, I wouldn't drink the water in between, but I would resample just to confirm. So, um, and again, if you do have bacteria, and you've done a total coliform sample, then you should probably test for E. coli, uh, which is harmful and can make you sick. So, um, but what we recommend uh, recently, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services um, had a grant from CDC, and they developed this website. It's called the Be Well Informed Guide. And it really was developed for New Hampshire residents, but it really works for anyone. Um, and you may actually see something similar to this popping up in more states. I know, um, the code that was used to develop this, New Hampshire's made available, and some of the states, um, other uh, environmental health agencies are working on trying to develop one that's more centric for their state. And so, um, but for right now, this is the only one we know of. And it's got a button here at the bottom that says enter your water test results. And so you click on that and you can type in, um, I typed in 15 uh, millig uh, micrograms per liter of arsenic. What's really nice about this is that a lot of folks um, have trouble converting from milligrams per liter to micrograms per liter, parts per million to parts per billion. And some of the previous um, iterations of some of these type of websites, you had to convert it yourself and type it in. And it would say, only use units that are milligrams per liter. Well, if you're not, uh, if you do that wrong or slip a decimal point, you could um, think that you have a much bigger problem than you really do, or you may think it's not a problem than it actually is. This one allows you to put it in the units that the lab gives you, whether that's micrograms per liter or milligrams per liter. And so to me, that's a big step up in some of these things. So if you have an entire water sample analysis, you can type in as many or as few of these as you like. I just typed in lead or arsenic at 15 ppb, knowing that the standard is 10 um, micrograms per liter, which is also parts per billion. And so when I do that, it comes up and puts a red X and says arsenic's over the standard of that's 0.015 milligrams per liter. It should be 0.01 or no more. It ex exceeds the drinking water standard. Well, that's the standard that a public water supply has to meet by um, law under the Safe Drinking Water Act. If you wanted to drink water with 15 ppb arsenic, um, you can. No one's going to tell you you can't. Uh, there are folks who um, believe that they've drank that water their whole life and they feel that it's safe and they may choose not to do anything about it. Um, we certainly disagree with that attitude and um, you know it's not just you drinking your water necessarily but um, back to the point of this website it also gives you a recommendation on how you might treat that and there's really two that it shows here either point of use uh, RO system reverse osmosis the second one listed here, or a point of use, 
arsenic um, absorption media filter system, which is usually a GAC, a granular activated carbon type system that takes out arsenic um, or some other media that you can uh, purchase to go in uh, certain kinds of filters. And both point of use means that it's at the kitchen sink, for instance. And I mentioned earlier a whole house arsenic um, or RO unit that would be called point of entry, and that's where it enters your house so that all the water in your house is being treated. What I can tell you about an RO unit is they use a lot of water that goes to waste, and your water, uh, you'll use a lot more water if you're doing that. And depending on the level of the contaminant in your water, um, it's really not necessary. Um, and, but again, that's something that you'd want to ask a health professional about. Most of the time, a point of use, so you're using it for drinking and cooking, um, is what you need. There are some things that you don't want to shower in as well. And again, that's something to ask your health department and your doctor about. So you can go down through this page. Um, you know, if you added other values, you can see at the bottom a value was not entered. But um, then they've got information available for uh, folks living in New Hampshire. And um, it you know, just talks about some of the issues as far as treatment. But uh, the things that are important here are NSF ANSI Standard 53 for arsenic absorption media and ANSI Standard um, 58 for point of use RO. Um, if you're going to buy some kind of treatment device to take out a contaminant that's a health risk, make sure you get one that's either certified through NSF and ANSI uh, that's, uh, or some other uh, certifier so that it actually takes out um, the constituent you're trying to remove. We had a well owner here just south of Champaign who had arsenic um, in their well and they added a um, RO unit to their kitchen sink. Um, I asked them later, you know, what did your water test at? It was 79 ppb before they added the RO unit and I asked them what, they, uh, what the level was after their RO unit and he said, boy, I don't know, I never thought to test it again. Well, you don't know if it's really working right, maybe there's an issue. Um, you know, once you've added treatment, you should always take another sample and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. So as far as interpreting results, again, I just want to reiterate uh, these tools like the Be Well Informed Guide are great for typical waters, um, but you should always take your results to a health department. Sometimes there's um, odd chemistries that, you know, really can't be predicted by these things. Um, and again, I want to mention that, you know, the environmental health professionals at a county or local health department or at the state, they're there really to help you and, and make sure that you're uh, doing what you need to to be safe. They're not there to tell you you can't drink your water or contaminate your well. Um, a lot of times they may recommend that and say, hey, I wouldn't drink this if I were you. But in the end, um, because it's a private well and there are no regulations, uh, it's up to you. Um, a couple other things that are important, um, mainly about construct, uh, correcting poor construction. And we got a question today that I've never been asked before, and I'll answer it later about what percentage of wells uh, that are contaminated have that issue because of poor construction? And so I'll get to that when I, when I get to the questions. But it really is the majority probably of wells that have some kind of contamination issue. It's because of poor well construction. And a lot of times that may be simply because the well's really old and it was put in, uh, you know, 50 years ago before there was even a construction code. So they did it with the best that they knew how. Um, but since we've learned a lot about contamination and some of those things, um, just like in the northern part of the United States, a lot of wells were put in pits because um, keeping it below the frost line meant your lines didn't freeze. And now, nowadays those pits really um, aren't needed and they're a risk, a health risk and some of those things. So um, the, the problem with a poorly constructed well is that not only is it uh, a chance for surface contamination to get in your uh, drinking water, but it's also a safety hazard, especially in the case of a, a well pit or an old dug well that may not be properly protected at the surface. So here's two examples. Um, the picture on the left came from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They have a blog, um, and they're the agency in the state of Washington that regulates drillers and well construction. And so it's different in every state. As I mentioned, it's DNR in Wisconsin. It's Illinois Department of Public Health in Illinois. Um, you, need, you, you can just Google my state well, log, uh, well logs and it'll come up with the agency that, uh, that deals with those in your state. 
or driller certification. So here, um, this is an old uh, large diameter well. You can see that um, the well construction uh, is galvanized, uh, big galvanized tubing, and uh, this piece of plywood that's over the well, and you can see the concrete block was probably over that small hole. Um, it gave way. It broke off when uh, the woman who lived there uh, walked over top of it. She may have walked over that a thousand times, but this time the plywood broke and it killed her. Um, but you can also see there's an old funnel there and so there's some insulation laying around. All that can just get in the well. That piece of plywood isn't good protection. Uh, mice, rats uh, can get in there. You can see the broom up in the corner. And so this well, obviously, not only was a safety hazard, but it also uh, was rotting plywood. Um, who knows what's fallen into that well, and then it's coming uh, into their kitchen or into their house, and they're drinking that water. Uh, this picture on the right, that's a goat. Uh, used to be a goat. And um, again, this was just an open well. They put a piece of concrete tile um, over the old hand-dug well so that it was elevated. Um, above ground, but it obviously wasn't high enough that the scout didn't find his way in there. And, um, you know, this seems pretty disgusting, I realize. Um, and these things actually, you know, they do happen. Um, when I was a kid, we had frogs get in our well because it wasn't protected surface. And I'll, I'll always remember that. And uh, my dad didn't think it was a big deal. But I know I don't necessarily want to drink water that's uh, coming from a uh, a small source where there's frogs in it so um, yeah so what should you do with those wells bring them up to code if you can find out what the current construction code is contract uh, a contractor or a well driller ask them what it'll take to actually do that um, not only does it protect your water quality but it's also safe uh, you can run over those with a tractor you, you know there's just a lot of things that can happen when you have either a pit or an old dug well um, you should extend a pipe up to the surface, fill it in with grout, and uh, those sorts of things. So um, there's a lot of folks who can help you, even your soil and water conservation district. In some areas, they have programs for even abandoning old wells, if that's what you need to do. Um, and find out what's you know best to um, make it safe and sealed so that you're not at risk of uh, surface contamination in your well. Um, so the other issue related to that is abandoned wells. And um, I mentioned the Soil Water Conservation District. They have actually, in, um, depending on your state, may have some funding to help uh, the, in the cost of sealing old abandoned wells. Um, because well logs weren't required in most states until at least the 60s, sometimes much later than that, there are probably more undocumented wells on file than there are wells that we have a log for. And that's, you know, for instance, in Illinois, it was 1968. We have, uh, we house the, uh, the State Water Survey houses all the well records for the state of Illinois, and we have about 500,000 well logs on file. There's probably closer to 800,000 to a million wells that are actually in use. Um, but all the older wells, uh, there may be a lot of old hand dug wells and those sorts of things where we don't even have a record. They're not used anymore. That's uh, getting into the area like the, the well with the goat. Um, some of those things can exist, um, you know, all over. And so they're uh, like, a, like a well that's in a pit, they're a safety hazard and a potential source of contamination. And uh, so if you have an old well on your property and you're not using it, you need to properly abandon and seal it so that um, you aren't responsible if someone falls in or gets hurt uh, or if it contaminates the aquifer and you maybe ruin an aquifer for you and your neighbors. And so um, you can be liable. And these are just some examples. Again, two more uh, pictures that came from uh, the Washington State Department of Ecology's blog. One has an old ho a horse got in an old well, and the other one here, the firemen are pulling a guy out of a well. He fell 45 feet. Um, it had water in it, and uh, he ended up not getting hurt, believe it or not. Um, so he was very lucky in that case. Um, but these uh, newspaper clippings on the other side here are all, three of those are from Illinois. The third one's actually Jessica McClure. If you're old enough to remember when she fell in a well, um, I believe it was only, um, I want to say it was a 12-inch well or maybe 14-inch well. Um, but she was in there for 18 hours, I think. And it was covered on CNN Live for uh, much of that time. And they got her out. She's an adult now. Um, but these other three, the Galesburg, um, Buffalo Grove, and the Springfield Paper Journal Register, 
those are all just kind of local papers in Illinois where one probably didn't know the other happened and all three of these happened in the same year, 1997. And so, yeah, uh, it happens a lot more than people think. They're a risk and uh, the message is if you have an old uh, well, you need to seal it. It could also be contaminating your actual drinking water well if you have more than one. So there's really no reason to keep them around. So um, that's what I have for the, you know, our part of the, uh, the message, so to speak. And the rest of this today, um, I'm going to go through the questions that you all um, gave us when you registered for the class uh, for this webinar. And so um, I'm not sure we cover all of them, um, but we cover a pretty good number of them uh, this time. And so we're going to go through those and hopefully answer your questions. And again, I'll mention that if you have any additional questions or if I don't answer your question, uh, if I got the intent wrong, um, you do have a question or a chat box on your GoToWebinar uh, screen that you can go to, click on the arrow, and uh, you can type in a question and Katie's monitoring that. So, um, so should pH be checked as well as chlorine? Yeah, I wasn't sure exactly what this meant, um, but um, if you're chlorinating your, your water now, then really the concern is uh, you should check your pH just to make sure that it's in a normal range. Um, if your pH is above 8, then it's probably less effective as it, than if it's 6 or 7. Um, it's because of the form of the chlorine that it takes depending on the pH. And if Dan were here, he could probably explain this a lot better. But the bottom line is, um, you know, it would probably take a little more chlorine to do the same amount of uh, work, if you will, to kill any bacteria that might be in your system um, versus uh, if the pH were lower. But it, if it gets too low, like a pH 4, uh, sometimes adding chlorine can cause chlorine gas formation. And if you're not aware, uh, that is extremely uh, toxic uh, and it can burn you and everything else. Um, it's not typical. You certainly don't see it in uh, a private water system. But uh, there's tons of safety regulations related to chlorine um, in a public water supply. Um, in some cases, they actually use chlorine gas as the initial type of chlorine that they're putting into the water uh, to disinfect. So, you know, you, you do want to measure your pH. It's a good parameter to understand uh, just to know about your drinking water. So, you know, pH of 7 is neutral. If your pH is lower than that, it could mean your water's uh, corrosive. Uh, so depending on what type of pipes you have, it could be an issue. And so it's just, it's a good thing to know as part of your overall drinking water quality, um, you know, what your pH is. And so I guess that's how I'd answer that question. Um, I haven't tested my water for 15 years. Uh, beside testing for bacteria, how can I test it for pesticides, arsenic, and, uh, you know, any other constituent? Well, um, as I mentioned before, the EPA maintains a website with links to each of the state's uh, primacy agencies, which is the agency that's in charge of being sure that a community water supply is meeting all the regulations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so you can go to EPA's webpage, this link here, it's Drinking Water Lab Certification, um, and they show all the states, and I'm going to go through this, and you can find all the labs that are certified in that state. They're not necessarily all in your state. Uh, sometimes labs are national in scope, and they may have uh, they may be doing certain kinds of analysis that communities in a number of different states send them. So I bring that up because some things aren't as easy to test for, uh, like some pesticides or some volatile organics. And normally we wouldn't suggest you test for those things unless you thought there was an issue. And so um, it's up to you because if you tested for everything that's required under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, it would likely cost you a couple thousand dollars. Um, to do that it, you know, if a lab had that capability. And so, um, yeah, anyway, um, there's things that are much more likely and there's things that might be situation specific. For instance, if there was an old gas station or a buried tank, um, then you might want to ask your health department, which things should I be testing for here that are volatile organics that might be related to a leak from this tank? Um, or if, you know, pesticides were stored, uh, then, you know, those are site-specific type instances of where there might be concern in most cases. So when you go to that page, you come here, um, then you can click on a link to get to uh, about certification of labs, and then 
when you get to there, there's a follow this link to get to, you can look at each state. If you click on your state, um, this says Alabama on the drop down, but I actually clicked on the state of Illinois and it takes me to the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency and you can click on that to pull down a PDF and they've separated it by chemical analysis versus micro, microbiological analysis. So um, a lot of labs do both, but then they'd be in both lists. So these are all PDFs and, um, you know, you can also ask even, um, I suggest asking your county health department. Um, most, like in Illinois, most of our county health departments don't have the capability, but our state public health lab does test for, uh, for bacteria. And then if you're going to do something else, you need to go to a private lab um, or like our lab does inorganics and metals and we're a university lab. So, um, or you can also ask, um, yeah, I would either ask your county health department where they should, where, what might be close by um, or what suggestions they have for being, uh, for picking a lab uh, to sample. Because, you know, their job in cases where there might be a problem, they've probably sent samples to um, certain labs uh, just to where they know there's a health issue and it might be related to some constituent. And so they're probably more familiar with the labs that are available in your area uh, than uh, using this list. Okay, so what if a well tests positive for total coliform? So really what does that mean? Um, as I mentioned before, coliform is not considered a harmful thing. It's just an indicator um, that there's a pathway into your well in all likelihood. But you should also, you know, was the well open recently? Uh, you know, was there some extreme event like was there a flood? Those things can cause coliform to get in your well. And, you know, once you've identified that you have coliform, then you should probably test for E. coli, as I mentioned before, as well. Um, and until you've tested and find out, you shouldn't use it for anything else. Um, again, Coliform bacteria is an indicator uh, that there's a pathway into your well. What that really means, though, is um, once you've disinfected uh, whether you, your well, and if it's, if it's clean, great, but if it's not resolved, then you need to consider what might be the source. If it's a shallow well and there's uh, livestock nearby or your septic's too close um, or some other issue that might be causing a continual source of contamination to get in your well, in that case, uh, continuing to uh, shock chlorinate your well isn't going to help. Groundwater moves. It's going to keep moving into your well as you pump water out. And so it's going to keep getting contaminated if there is a continual source available like a septic system. So in those cases, you might need to think about a continuous disinfection system, whether that be a chlorination or UV. Um, and the UV, ultraviolet light, kills bacteria and viruses and all those things. It's used in community water supplies in certain situations. And there's a market now uh, for UV systems, even on the, for private uh, water systems. So um, I know in some areas where there's a lot of springs or karst topography where there's a lot of contamination, um, like at Tennessee or in southern Indiana, or Illinois, or Kentucky, uh, there's a lot of UV used. Um, for private water systems. Um, they say let your water run, oh, it says fun, let your water run for five minutes to test your well water, uh, in quotes, but shouldn't you test the water you'll actually be drinking coming from your pipes? Well, you know, uh, generally what we've, you know, this is a good question because it's confusing, I get that. Generally, we only hear about letting a water run for five minutes in relation to testing for lead or copper uh, because of household plumbing. Um, it's not let your water run for five minutes uh, so that you can test well water. And the reason is um, because it depends on the size of your pressure tank. So, you know, the way your water system works, your pressure tank has um, a high pressure and a low pressure that it's set on. And um, water pumps from your well and fills up the pressure tank until it reaches a high pressure point. Say that's 50 PSI and it shuts off. Then as you start running water, it's pulling, it's pushing it from your um, pressure tank until it reaches the low value. Let's say that's 30 psi. At what, at that point, then the pump kicks on and starts pumping water through the system, but it still goes through your pressure tank first. So depending on the size of your pressure tank, or if you have a holding tank, 
um, it could take a lot longer than five minutes uh, for water uh, that's coming out your kitchen tap to actually be from your well directly and not have sat in your pipes or in your pressure tank at all. So what we do as scientists when we're trying to measure groundwater samples, we try to use an outside spigot that's close to the well if it's available, and then we measure parameters in real time. So we'll run it through a little device that measures pH, conductivity, and temperature, and we wait till those things are stable, and it might take as much as 20 minutes um, before we take what we would consider a well sample or a groundwater sample. And, you know, you aren't going to do that as a well owner. Um, so what we mentioned earlier about taking two samples, that's really what we suggest you do. Um, that way you get a good handle on what the groundwater water quality might be um, before it actually enters your house by taking a water sample from an outside spigot and do let it run for five or ten minutes first. Um, but then take a sample from your kitchen tap where you're getting what's representative for drinking water. I mean, you know, you, we, you tell people they should wait five, five minutes or so before they take a sample, or, um, and they should actually do that before they actually collect a, a water for drinking, um, but most people probably don't do that. And so it is important to take a sample um, that's been sitting in your pipe so you understand, especially, you know, if you have kids, they're, they're not going to let it sit and run for five minutes before they put a glass underneath it to get a sample of water. And so you want to know what's actually coming out uh, right away. So, um, and as I said here, they can be very different. Um, and as I showed earlier, those that, that set of samples I showed before, depending on what kind of treatment you have, um, your water may be very different that comes into the house versus what's coming out of your kitchen sink so or kitchen tap. Um, so this is a question I mentioned earlier. Uh, what percentage of contaminated wells are caused by improper well construction? You know, they said, give me your best estimate. So um, this is me personally. If I were estimating, I'd say at least 60 to 70 percent are because of poor construction. Um, or uh, improper construction. And these are mostly because they're older wells, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they weren't built to the current well code, so they may have used other types of materials. They may not have sealed it at the surface. You know, now there's rules that say what kind of well cap you can use, if it's vented, how. Um, the other thing is, you know, even cast iron um, wears eventually and rusts and welds can uh, go bad, and that's one of the things I tell people with uh, steel wells, um, that each of those sections of pipe were welded together, and if the guy who welded that left one spot that wasn't quite welded as thick as everything else, eventually, depending on the type of soil and everything, uh, and how acidic things might be, it could eventually uh, rust that and cause an opening uh, in the well casing. And, you know, wells aren't meant to last forever. Um, I would, you know, we do see wells over 100 years old that are still in use and their water quality is fine, but that's the, not the norm. Um, typically, your well isn't going to last forever. Um, I'd, uh, it's probably even a bigger estimate to say how long they might last, but uh, eventually uh, you're going to have to do something about that. And so the other, the other issue we see is that the well's not maintained. So a lot of times, um, I've actually sampled probably at least a 1,000 wells in Illinois over uh, my time at the water survey, and many times you find a well where there's no screen on the vent cap, or vent tube, or they've got the, the cap is partially off, and there's an opening, and you know, maybe it's only a, a half-inch pipe sticking up, but that's wide open and you can see spider webs down in it, um, or there's five or six uh, bolts that hold the well cap in place, and several of those are missing. The rubber seal that's supposed to be in there, the gasket that's supposed to keep it, quote, sealed, um, hasn't been changed in 20 years, and uh, it's all brittle, and there's pieces of it missing. So, um, you know, it is. It's about having it properly constructed or bringing it up to current code and then making sure you maintain things. And one thing we probably don't stress enough is if you've had your well for 15 or 20 years, you should replace that gasket on your well cap. Because uh, no matter, um, you know, over time, those things get brittle, especially if you're in an environment that includes freezing during the winter. Um, there's just a lot of things that, you know, things wear out. That's just the way it is. So um, other causes of contamination that wouldn't be that 60 to 70 percent would be naturally occurring contaminants. Some areas that uh, a given county, 90 percent of the contamination of wells may be because of some natural contaminant like that beryllium example I showed you, or, you know, there's arsenic or, you know, radium. 
Um, it's just a known quantity. I know we were working with a small community water supply in western Illinois, and they haven't gone to the deep aquifer there. It's a 1,500 feet down into bedrock because they know the radium's high and they're going to have to treat. And that causes a lot of other issues for a community water supply just because you have to deal with that waste whenever you're done with it and what to do with the, the radium that, you know, you've taken out of the water. So there's some areas where naturally occurring contaminants are a significant issue. But other things, if you have an old hand dug well, they can be perfectly safe. Um, but there's certainly more of a risk depending on what's around it because they're taking water from the shallow water table in some cases. So it could be a septic system or livestock um, or just a, a surface water connection or even just the aquifer itself is vulnerable. In um, eastern New York, uh, um, well, a lot of New York actually, um, bedrock is right at the surface. Maybe it's only a foot down. It might be in some places 10 feet down or in some places it's at the surface itself. It's all fractured. So water from the surface can run right into the aquifer or in a karst topography. Um, we have Pike County in Illinois. 90% um, of the water samples that the county health department tests have bacteria in them because it's, they're basically open um, to anything that's at the surface. So there's no way to keep anything out and they're just vulnerable. And so in those cases, uh, we see uh, large rural water districts going in in some of those cases where now it's a community water supply and it's supplying water to every home, even in a rural setting, or you see uh, that they have continuous uh, disinfection because there's no way to stop uh, those sources from being there. And so, um, you know, whenever you have that kind of continual source of contamination, you really, the only option is to treat. Okay, so do animals grazing on your property increase risks uh, to well water? Well, it really depends on the situation. Um, you know, I grew up on a small farm, and I can tell you that our cattle pasture, where we only had a few cows, wasn't going to be a big deal if the well were over there and uh, it was deep enough. But uh, where we had confined hogs, um, it could be much more of an issue, like a feedlot where it's all mud all the time. Um, we ran into wells. Um, example one here says a shallow dug well in a feedlot, very bad. We ran into a, a home that they were using this large diameter hand dug well. It was right in the middle of a feedlot that was a two foot thick of mud because it always had livestock in it and you know they it was always just that way. And they were getting their water from you know from ten to twenty feet below land surface uh, in an old dug well. Um, that well certainly has bacteria issues uh, because of the feedlot and the number of cows that were in there. Um, but in a lot of cases, if a well is properly constructed, and depending on the length of casing, um, so that the water is coming in from below the casing, um, then the concentration, and, and also the concentration of livestock. If it's only a few uh, livestock grazing in a pasture, and your well is properly constructed, as example two here shows, a 200-foot well with more than 100 feet of casing and overburden, which means the unconsolidated sand, gravel, and clay that's over the bedrock then it's likely that bedrock aquifer wouldn't be contaminated by uh, that as long as it's properly constructed and grouted. So it's probably not an issue. But then, you know, it just depends. Like in New York, where you may only have 10 to 20 feet of casing and the bedrock's right at the surface and it's cracked and has fissures in it, then, um, you know, it's more likely that things will get down into the aquifer and cause a problem. So, you know, it kind of depends on your situation. If you have more details you want to send us, um, you can email us. Uh, you go to our website, privatewellclass.org. Uh, there's an email address at the bottom of the page. You can email us there. Um, or when you get after this webinar, you'll get an email follow-up, and that comes to me. And so you can certainly email me back, too. Um, I have a spring with a 200-gallon spring box. What should I do to disinfect the spring? Well, the spring itself is just an outcrop of groundwater discharging um, out of the ground. And it's constantly moving. It's coming from another source. There's no way to actually disinfect the spring itself, if that was your question. Um, but what, you, what most people do that have a spring, um, or they should do, is they disinfect the water before it comes into their home. So it would probably be after the spring box. Um, the pipe that's coming into your home or down in your basement where your pressure tank is, 
you would add either continuous chlorine or ultraviolet light uh, to disinfect and kill any bacteria and, and things that can get into your water. Um, you can certainly clean out your spring box and disinfect it uh, with a chlorine solution. And I've included this guide to private water systems in Pennsylvania because they have a really good explanation of what your spring box should be, um, things you need to be have a precaution. And I know there's a statement in that manual that basically says because these are getting water from shallow groundwater and they're very likely to be contaminated, um, if you have a spring, you really probably have to have uh, some kind of treatment that's continuous. And so that's really the, you know, the short answer uh, for that is you're going to have to have disinfection if you're using a spring. Um, and I, I can't think of a case where you wouldn't in order to be sure that you're not getting some kind of bacterial contamination. Um, how do I eliminate the sulfur, rotten egg smell, and brown rusty color from my well? So. Um, typically, you use chlorine. That sulfur odor is uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria in most cases. Um, there are bedrock cases where it's just uh, it's sulfate that's in the actual groundwater or in the rock. Um, but in most cases, when you see that and have that sulfur smell, it's a sulfate-reducing bacteria. So you need to chlorinate. Sometimes you might have to do that several times. Um, but yeah, it should take care of it. And uh, it's possible if it's a really bad situation or there's a, a source for those bacteria and you can't actually get rid of them, they can be in the aquifer itself, then you may have to add continuous chlorination uh, to do that in, that, uh, in order to eliminate that. So in the brown color, if you have brown color in your well, it's likely rust or sediment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sand. Uh, groundwater typically is high in iron. And whenever you bring it up from the ground, in the ground, it's um, in uh, it's unoxidized, and as soon as it hits air and, and can oxidize it, chemical reaction forms those particulates that form the brown rusty color on your uh, porcelain and uh, all that stuff, that red color. And so, um, one of the good things you can do then is add a sediment filter, typically five micron, uh, 0.5 micron, then um, and that'll, especially if it's had a chance to be oxidized, that'll take out most of that. So, and they do make oxidizing filters. Dan answered this question, and uh, and I'm trying just to make sense of it here. So, um, if you have a follow up or another uh, question, or I didn't answer it uh, to your satisfaction, email me, and when Dan gets back next week, we'll have him uh, shoot you an email. Uh, so, is water from dug wells safe to drink? You know, generally. It, um, if it's properly constructed, all wells, it should be safe to drink. But we've already went through this, I think. If it's a shallow dug well, then there's more things to consider. Um, you know, the source of your water is shallow water table in a lot of cases, or a shallow, uh, a shallow aquifer unit that may be very thin, you know, a few inches of sand, for instance. And so, you know, you probably want to test a little more often uh, for bacteria and nitrate, and you want to make sure that it's properly constructed. Uh, these days, you know, the, the old construction was even using cement three-foot tile all the way to the surface with a concrete lid. Nowadays, at least in Illinois, a lot of these um, have just a regular six-inch or five-inch PVC casing that comes to the surface, and the actual three-foot diameter well part starts at 10 feet below land surface, and that upper 10 feet is filled with clay or things that, are, you know, don't allow water to move through them very fast. Um, some kind of bentonite or soil material so that it gives you a little more protection from the surface. So um, they should be, they can be, um, you just need to be aware and it's no, really no different than the things we've already discussed that every well owner should be uh, aware of. A, a 200 foot drilled well into bedrock uh, can be a risk if the aquifer itself is near the surface and um, easily contaminated. And I mentioned New York before, we saw that there. Um, a lot of wells may have been several hundred feet deep, but they might have only had 15 or 20 feet of casing. And then after that, it's an open hole. And so anything that gets into any of the fractures that are below 15 feet um, will contaminate that well. So um, how do I obtain a copy of my well log? I would go to your driller first if you know who your driller is. In a lot of cases, the well may be there when you buy the property, I understand. Um, ask your county or local health department if they have records or if they can tell you who does in your state. 
which would be a state agency that maintains those records. In Illinois, you can come to the State Water Survey or State Geological Survey. Uh, the, the problem is that um, for many wells, there just is no log. It wasn't a requirement. It's been built before the records were in place. Or uh, in some cases, uh, there's the driller, either the drilling industry or the state itself was slow uh, to deal with uh, the new law that required you to file a log. And I know some states were better at others in making sure those were maintained. In some states, they just have rules that don't um, lend themselves to having that information. In Mississippi, you have to file for a permit, but you only have to file a log, I believe, if it's uh, more than five inches in diameter. So if you have a four or five inch well and you live in Mississippi, the odds are that the only person that has that record is the guy who drilled it. And uh, if that was you know, 30 years ago and that drilling company is long gone or the driller is long gone, then um, you know, there's no way to get those re that information. So, and even in Illinois, where we started, uh, the law was changed in 1968 to require drillers to file a permit and a log through the county health department. And all of our drillers have really bought into all that. And they file logs like they're supposed to. And the county submits those to the water survey and the geological survey on a regular basis. We probably, uh, I might have mentioned earlier, we probably have uh, maybe 50 to 60 percent of all the well records for wells that we know exist in Illinois. So uh, in a state like New York, they didn't pass that law until 2000. So any well before 2000 doesn't necessarily have a log on file, which is probably the vast majority. So um, what are the different kinds of drinking and house wells? Well, um, so we have a class, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, but lesson three is all about the well types, whether it's a dug well, a drilled well into sand and gravel, or a drilled well into bedrock, and what those mean. And, you know, they, there, there are differences in each type and where the water is coming from and how safe they are. And, uh, you know, I could spend um, an hour just talking about that issue. So what I recommend, go to privatewellclass.org, sign up for the online lessons uh, that are emailed to you. It's all free. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself here because I'm going to talk about that next. But it's, uh, you know, there's the whole point of that is to teach you the differences. And uh, in some cases, you may live in a, a, the location where your home is. You may have two or three different aquifers that you can choose from to put a well in. They have different chemistry. In a lot of cases, you have one or maybe even none. And so, um, you know, it, it all depends on your local geology and what's available to you because of that. So... Uh, it's a very local thing. Okay, so more about the private well class. As I mentioned, it's 10 lessons. They're sent via email. It's self-paced. Um, All together, there's about 80 pages of information, including figures and stuff. So that works out to about six to eight pages per lesson. Um, and they come once a week. So when you sign up, you'll get a lesson right then emailed to you. It's a PDF. And after that, um, they come, uh, they should come at the same time every week. If you're a sanitarian and you want to take this class for CEUs, we have a version of this that's on NEHA's website, and you can go to their e-learning center and find that on the EPA tab, because this is funded through EPA, that's where they put it, but it has a quiz after each lesson, and each lesson is worth one CEU. Hmm, excuse me. So, um, in addition to the lessons, there's a lot of other information on our website, which I'll talk about now. Um, this is the front page, and so you click on Learn by Email on the bottom left, and then there's a place to sign up. It's here. Just your email address, your first name, and where you live, and that's a drop-down by state. And the whole idea here is one of the things we have to show or need to show to EPA is that folks all over the country are taking this. It's meant to be a national program, and so telling us where you live just helps us with that. And and uh, determining, you know, how many folks in each state have actually heard of us and, and taken the class. More than 5,000 people have taken the class already. Um, it's been vetted uh, through a lot of folks and uh, seems to be uh, well received. So I think we think you'll learn something and uh, learn a lot more about how to take care of your well uh, by going through that. With each lesson under the resources library, there's also um, a set of additional resources, like for lesson one, it's called the Science of Groundwater. So it's about how water moves and basic concepts about how water gets into the ground, all that stuff, and hydrology. And you can see any of these you can click on there by different sources. Most of them are either extension or state agency or Department of Health. 
and uh, or NGWA, National Groundwater Association, uh, we, we link to quite a bit as well. And so all these are publicly available. And uh, if you know something in the lesson didn't resonate with you, you can look through some of these other resources, which we've vetted and feel like um, are pretty useful. And uh, lesson two is groundwater well contamination. It's more about um, what happens to you know contaminant particle when it gets into the ground. Um, what are different sources of contamination, all that sort of stuff. So uh, there's one of these for each of the 10 lessons. And um, yeah, they're worth going through, especially the additional reading that's here from all these, uh, to learn about the basics and see how different people view this stuff and, and all that. So we also created under webinars and or under on the front page, you can click on videos and it brings you to a page where it lists their 16 training videos. And this says 23 webinar recordings under categories up here. Now that's up closer to 30, I imagine. Uh, this is one of the, a, a webinar we did last year about lead. And um, so you can look through those. You can watch the video. And they have a lot of information on, uh, this is when we did it, like I said, on lead about that particular topic, what to be concerned with, what to look for, um, understanding what type of pipes you have, and understanding the water chemistry of your groundwater as it comes into your house to know whether lead might be an issue. You know, in a lot of cases, if the pH is right um, and it's above, uh, if it's higher and there's, you know, there's other parts of chemistry that can uh, affect whether things are considered corrosive or not. But if your water is not corrosive, a lot of times lead pipes build up a film on the inside, um, kind of a, a coating that then protects the water from uh, even being exposed to lead. So, um, you know, in a lot of cases, or in some cases anyway, having lead pipes isn't an issue if the type of water chemistry dictates that that coating gets formed on it and uh, so that it wouldn't cause a problem. So there's uh, somewhere close to 30 of these recordings related to, including today's, which is being recorded, will be up here as well. Um, but there's also these training videos and uh, there's 16 of them up there right now. How does my private water system work? What is a dug well? You know, what's a bedrock well? Um, how does my pressure tank work? Um, ironically, that is our most popular video. How does my pressure tank work? And what it tells us is there's lot, not a lot of information out there for folks with pressure tanks on how they actually work and what they need to do to um, ensure they're getting adequate water pressure um, if they're undersized, some of those things but also that um, it's really an issue, um, that there's a lot of pressure issues with private water systems. It's had well over 100,000 hits in about a year and a half, and so, um, you know, it's a pretty popular video. Um, so overall, the goal of our program uh, for you as a well owner, um, or even if you're a sanitarian, uh, is to help well owners understand why their well is important, why you need to understand how it works so that you have a better idea of when something's not working right, and then most importantly, how to protect yourself from any kind of risk or health risk. And so uh, that's the goal of our program, and um, I'm, I think that's all I have for today. So hang on, and I'll look and see if we have any questions that have come up uh, that Katie's been tracking. And so... Um, I'm going to pull that on the screen here, and it looks like no questions today. Um, well, so um, there's our email address, info at privatewellclass.org. You can always uh, email us later if something comes up. Um, and it looks like Katie's typing something here. Google Docs is a wonderful thing if you're not familiar with it. It allows us to share a document live, and so Katie's typing, and I can see it, and so can all of you. Um, water line breaks to domestic storage tank from private water well. Um, I guess I don't understand if, if a water line breaks. You know, it's not like a city water system that's under pressure where when the water line breaks you have a boil order um, and all that stuff. Um, you may not be treating your water at all in the first place, and that's why that works that way. Um, but if you're... Yeah, I guess I don't understand the question. Um, if you have a water line break, or, hmm. Well, why don't you email us and uh, flush that out a little more. Uh, tell us what the situation is, and we can get back to you. So, 
Um, yeah. All right. Well, with that, it's quarter after two. We're getting in a little early today, but um, we will, with that, call it a day. So thank you for attending. If, like I said, if anything comes up later, just email us. And if you look on our website under webinars, you can see the ones that are coming up in the future. Um, most are for well owners, but we have a few that are for other uh, types of professionals that work with well owners. Um, I know we have one um, with environmental health professionals, and we've done one for realtors and labs in the past. Um, we also plan to do two webinars um, in Spanish this year. And so if you are uh, a health professional or someone who works with well owners, um, you can look on our website. If it's not there today, it will be soon uh, with information about uh, the Spanish language webinars. And uh, there's a Spanish website that's coming soon. should be up fairly soon. We're just waiting on the URL stuff from the University of Illinois and um, because there's a lot of need uh, there as well. So um, thanks again. And with that, um, everyone have a good day.